The King James Bible remains the most recognizable piece of literature in the English-speaking world. It stands as a masterful example of translation for its day, involving some of history's most remarkable scholars. For over three centuries, it served as the standard English Bible and has had unparalleled influence on English and American culture in nearly every sphere, including education, law, literature, government, art, science, and religion. Even though English has changed a lot over the last 400 years, there are thousands of people who believe the KJV to be the only trustworthy translation in English and strongly discourage or even forbid the use of modern versions. This has come to be called KJV onlyism. In the next two episodes, Dr. Mark Ward is going to help us understand this mentality and graciously and lovingly argue why it's unhelpful. I enjoyed this fascinating conversation so much, and I think you will too. Here we go. If you're new here, I'm Andrew Case, and this is Working for the Word. Let me tell you a little bit about our guest. Dr. Mark Ward holds a PhD in New Testament interpretation. His dissertation's title was Paul's Positive Religious Affections, which sounds awesome in an Edwardsian sort of way, doesn't it? He's also the author of an incredible book called Authorized, The Use and Misuse of the King James Bible which I cannot recommend highly enough for its readability and insights into this issue. And he also has a really high-quality YouTube channel that you'll do well to check out. Mark is the perfect person to talk about the King James, and you'll see why soon. So let's listen to him introduce his background and how he grew up in a KJV-only environment. My parents became Christians as young adults, and though they had some connection to Christianity, mainly in a cultural way, they both gravitated quickly toward the Bible. In fact, my father was saved simply by reading the Bible as a freshman at the University of Virginia, which to me has become a story that's even more special over time. Mm. And the Bible that they both knew and used at this point in the mid to late 70s was, of course, the King James Version. So when years and years later, with two little kids in tow, my parents moved back into the D.C. area. My father was going to work for National Religious Broadcasters. As he was looking at the areas we could afford to live in in Northern Virginia, he found a church that had a Christian school, and you needed to go to the church in order to use the Christian school, and it was close to our house. And he didn't really know. He just told me this the other day. We were just talking. It was a King James-only church. It didn't strike Hmm. him because that wasn't strange. He used the King James, you know, the great majority of, majority of evangelical Christians he had known in the, boy, now by that time, maybe 10 or 15 years of his Christian life had used the King James. So um, that didn't, it didn't bother him that these people used it exclusively, so did he. But he didn't really know, as still a young Christian himself, that this group of Christians viewed the King James not as a preference, but as a matter of doctrinal exigency. We've got to use this translation. It's the only faithful one. I was, therefore, indoctrinated with that view as a 14 or 15-year-old. But here's the thing. A lot of people describe the, you know, difficult situations and, you know, legalism they experienced in those circles, and I don't deny their experience, but I had a good experience. I liked my teachers, they were godly and gracious, Mm -hmm. and the King James onlyism just, it it hardly went onto my radar because I didn't have any other Christian friends who were saying, this is wrong. I used the King James, I prided myself in my ability to read it. It wasn't until college that I was acquainted through my new pastor in college, with other translations and good reasons to use them. And so I was very gently disabused of the faulty notions that I had. And because I had a positive experience in that world, I developed something of a burden over the years, a conviction, even a calling Mm. to reach back out to them in the spirit of, I hope, the person I played in the high school play in that King James Only Christian School, William Tyndale. I was Mm. burned at the stake in front of all my friends and family 
in the school gym as William Tyndale, and I uttered those hmm. you know stirring words, um, "Lord, open the King of England's eyes," and it became my prayer over time, "Lord, open King James Onlyism's eyes." So. Hmm. I wrote a book, I've done some other blogging and YouTubing, authorized the use and misuse of the King James Bible. So how long since this calling have you been doing this? I'm going to say it's about 10 years. Okay. Uh, and it's picked up speed over time. I hope it isn't careening, but um, I've, I'm doing more now than I ever have because I invest a lot of time in my YouTube channel, although that's evolving too. I'm kind of moving away probably from touching on this debate as frequently, but I have personal contacts all over the world with people Mm. in King James only circles who simply have not been exposed to Mm. the other side, what what I would just call orthodox bibliology. And they are open and they are reaching out. I'm talking to them. But uh, I I really got maybe activated to this, um, even a little bit radicalized when I was involved in neighborhood evangelism efforts in a, you know, downtrodden portion of Greenville, South Carolina, literally across the tracks. I lived there. I love these people. Yeah. And I saw they simply were just bewildered by the King James Version. And uh, mm. I that's kind of what got me thinking, I actually have to do something. <laughs> And uh, the the book and the YouTube channel and articles are the result. Awesome. Now, for those who have never really encountered the KJV-only world, how would you help them understand what it's like, where these people are coming from, what are some of their soapboxes, I guess, and... How many people does this represent, more or less? You know, um, I was just asking some friends of mine who are who join me in this work, who really love the King James only folks, our brothers and sisters in Christ. How many are there? And we're not aware of any official count. I would say, and they seem to agree this is at least feasible, you know, we're at least in the thousands of churches, if not up around the 10,000 range around Mm. the world, because it's not just in America, Canada, and Britain that there are King James-only churches. And then there are King James-only individuals within churches that don't necessarily hold that doctrine. I'm not aware of anybody anybody who's come up with a responsible count, but I, I just like to think it's a lot, and yeah. it's certainly enough f- to to make worthwhile the time that I am spending and several other friends in various ways trying to reach out to that group. You ask, you know, where does this come from? What are their soapboxes? And I've been a faithful listener now to your own podcast, and I'm just thrilled to be on it. It's one of my favorite ones. I <laughs> absolutely love to nerd out about this kind of stuff, Bible translation. I've really been enjoying the stuff about Chinese Bible translation. And you have, you mentioned some time ago, you know, and we talked about this personally, you are trying to teach New Testament and Old Testament textual criticism, at least the basics, to even indigenous translators. And I thought, wow, that is bold. And I thought, wow, that is good. If you don't do that, then the dark places of ignorance that that breeds can get some mold growing in there. And mm. I see King James only ism, not the people, the ism, the doctrine, yeah. as a mold growing in the darkness of ignorance. I frequently run into people who simply don't know. <laughs> I don't want to say they don't know what they're talking about. They have the talking points down, but they don't know Greek or Hebrew. They've never even been exposed to the standard, basic, evangelical, orthodox, bibliological teaching on this topic. And I totally understand. I sympathize with them. It's scary to be told. We have an inerrant Bible, but we don't have perfect manuscripts of that Bible. That's, you know, kind of mind-blowing. And your heart reaches out to Christ. These are our brothers and sisters. I mean, maybe at the very extreme ends Mm. of that movement, there are some non-Christians, uh, you know, the way yeah. they treat other people makes me wonder yeah. because they don't love uh, their fellow believers, but the great majority of them and, you know, everyone that I knew most certainly was a true believer, they just wanted to have certainty that the words they had in their hands, and they'll often say this, were actually God's words, and mm-hmm. I'm totally with them. But what they end up doing is taking their inerrant Bible and raising it high, as I do, inspired words of God, utterly crucial for our lives and for our salvation, and they raise it a little higher. 
Mm -hmm. And the soapbox they stand on, when they stand on it, they say things like, we have the perfectly preserved word of God. We have God's word in our hands. So right. um, because I can sympathize so well with where they're coming from, I reach out to them with, I hope, a spirit that is godly and understanding, and they respond really, really well to that. A great m many of them do. Mm. I've really enjoyed this little calling and ministry I've had. Yeah. Uh, I, I find these are often people who know their Bibles, they've read them, um, and they're ripe to be taught just that little extra truth about the history, how we got our Bibles. Now, you mentioned ignorance as one of the, the root causes. Sometimes I, I see it as also this nostalgia and uh, also tradition, this, the strength of tradition that drives this kind of mentality. Would you agree with that? Or are there any other root causes that you've seen? Yeah, you know, I've done some really careful reflecting on this, I hope. I mean, I was raised in that King James-only tradition, and I didn't move very far away from it when I went to college. And in both settings, I was warned about the dangers of tradition far, far more often than I was acquainted with any of its benefits. Indeed, I'd say it was till deep in seminary that I heard anybody say anything positive about mm -hmm. tradition. Mm -hmm. And I've come to have what I hope is a more balanced view. You know, Paul uses the word tradition. He actually, in some of the key separation from disobedient brothers passages that get talked about a lot in the more fundamentalist circles like the King James Only World in 2 Thessalonians 3, the thing that you're supposed to withdraw from fellowship over is people's failure to uphold the traditions that Paul gave them. Mm. Now, we don't have direct access to those. What we have is the Bible, but I still have a basically positive idea that in general, the previous generations of Christians have come up with a lot of good stuff, and if I can, I'm going to hold on to it. It's semper reformanda. I'm always reforming in the light of the norm of Scripture. That's what they taught me too. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that I have to reinvent everything we do, you know, every generation, every time I start a church. So the idea that I'm going to use the traditional Bible translation of the English-speaking people makes perfect sense. Why upset the apple cart, you know, introduce unnecessary fights and changes if, if there's no benefit. It, we have to get to the place where the benefit outweighs the, I think, undeniable detriment. You know, we had yeah. a monolithic Bible. There's a lot of good that comes with that. And the first chapter of my book, Authorized, is all about the goods that come from having a common standard. Yeah. Um, but I think that the time has come and, and indeed has passed that the value of having that common standard has been outweighed by the difficulties to cause to regular readers that that man, the uninitiated man of 1 Corinthians 14, who's supposed to come down, come into the church and hear people prophesying and fall down on his face and confess that God is in you of a truth. I'm still quoting the King James because it's still in my heart. Um, mm -hmm. We're not able to reach that man. We're not able to reach our children and even ourselves because of the archaisms in the in the yeah. King James Elizabethan language. So I'm trying to carefully weigh these values. Tradition is valuable. It's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. But right. it, over time, can make void the Word of God, as Jesus said to the Pharisees. I think one thing we should probably say at the outset is that we're both extremely impressed by the KJV in general. It's a magisterial translation. The people who did it were geniuses. Yes. It, it really is a landmark that has changed the world, and uh, we don't, you know, we don't deny that at all. I, I just want to affirm that it is an amazing work of art. Yeah. And can I jump in here, Andrew, and interrupt you? Because I just have to say this. I've just been really thinking about this again. Tradition. Um, ironically enough, I feel like I am honoring the King James tradition more than the King James only folks are, yeah. because I'm doing the things that the King James translators said they were doing. Exactly. And even more specifically, an argument I've been making, I'm not even sure where you'd land on this, Andrew, I'd, I'd love to hear from you on this topic, but you know, if my church comes down to decide, as we did a couple years ago, you know, what translation are we going to use? I self-consciously chose a translation within the King James tradition, not 
because I'm certain that formal translations are better than more functional ones, let's say the ESV versus the NIV, for example. Not because I think anybody's sinning to make a different choice, mm -hmm. but because I thought the King James translation has proven its utility for your kind of standard, averagely educated, you know, Christian congregation. And why would I reinvent that wheel when I have good translations in that tradition? So I sure. explicitly stuck with tradition when it came time for me to make a choice. Yeah, so I think that's a, what a lot of really wise leaders have, have done. So absolutely. Now, what are some of the straw men that people tend to have when it comes to the KJV only world. So, have you seen any of that? And how how would you caution people against having a the wrong the wrong view? The first thing that comes to my mind is you know if you have experienced King James onlyism, but you don't have a personal connection to it, my guess is that you saw it in some sort of social media forum. Okay. So whether it be a forum or a Facebook group about Bible study or you know. I, I, a blog comments or something, YouTube comments. You can certainly see this on my YouTube channel. Um, if you experience that level of King James onlyism, you will think that everybody, everybody in it is not only ignorant but a jerk. And okay. I choose that language advisedly because there are some people who just go off. I mean questioning my salvation and insulting me personally and calling me a liar. And right. I could see how Christians would just go, whoa, this movement is crazy. Mm -hmm. And that that is both a part of the truth, because the extremists really do get extreme. Mm -hmm. And it's a straw man, because there are people who actually know what they're talking about, who are making serious arguments in defense of the Textus Receptus edition yeah. of the Greek New Testament. Um, who actually can give some more sophisticated arguments that, you know, your average evangelical Christian is probably not going to have any idea how to answer. Because like all conspiracy theories, and it is a conspiracy theory, it's saying that all the people, all the evangelical Christians who say they're trying to help us, you know, give us good Bible translations like the New King James and the NIV and the NASB, they're part, they're either dupes of Satan's scheme, or they're actually on his side giving us, you know, Bible translations that are corrupted. That That is what they say, even when they give more sophisticated arguments, okay. um, it, even using Greek. Ultimately, they're saying all the Bibles out there other than the King James are corrupted. People who experience that kind of argumentation, I, I think they're, they're not going to be ready for some of the more um, academically oriented arguments that are out there, and they are out there, and I think it's Christian charity to try to represent your opponents by their best proponents. That's really, that's really helpful, because I think, well, in this day and age, nobody gravitates towards balance. <laughs> right. So I want to be somebody who helps cultivate balance within the evangelical world on this podcast, so that's good. So I'll jump in with a little story anecdote here. When I was in London, I visited Spurgeon's old church, the Metropolitan Tabernacle, and I noticed that they had a bookstore with several booklets they had put together about how different translations were deceptive or bad. So they had one against the ESV, the NIV, and one dedicated to undermining the NKJV. So as you can imagine, I, I was appalled and this is a big church. It's quite significant size church for for Europe in general, for the UK especially. Very, very diverse church. I would say maybe half or more were immigrants. And I was just appalled that they would spend so much energy and resources speaking against vernacular translations instead of simply working on updating the language of the KJV to their liking, as Spurgeon would have probably done. Yes. So that their congregation, especially the ones who for whom English is not their native language, could understand right. it better. So I talked to some of them. I never really got a clear answer. I, how would somebody more sophisticated maybe respond to this encouragement? Well, it's interesting you mentioned that particular place and ask about those who are more sophisticated because that's where some of the most sophisticated defenders of the King James are. Interesting. I don't actually know the relationship between the Trinitarian Bible Society 
and um, Peter Masters Church, you know, Metropolitan Tabernacle. I yeah. believe there's some kind of relationship. I'm, I'm just, again, not totally sure what. Uh, but I was actually there in 2004, and I remember hmm. seeing Trinitarian Bible Society materials there. I feel a lot of kinship, honestly, with the Trinitarian Bible Society, just in general as conservative, you know, holiness-loving Christians who love doctrine. Mm. Um, that's them. And the again, it's the idea that we've got this inerrant Bible, and it just makes sense, right, that if God is going to give us a Bible without error, His inspired words, He's going to preserve it too. And so they've constructed an elaborate series of doctrines to defend this idea. The Trinitarian Bible Society is the group that actually puts out, that publishes the edition of the Greek New Testament, that is the Textus Receptus. But it's not just the Textus Receptus, it's F.H.A. Scrivener's 1881 edition of the Textus Receptus. It actually reconstructs all the textual critical decisions of the King James translators. They are therefore, you know, a leading, you know, proponent of King James onlyism in the world. But what they would say is the text is the issue. And if you want the sophisticated response that you would have found if you could have poked around there long enough at the Metropolitan Tabernacle, you would have certainly run into somebody who would have said, oh, yes, well, in theory, we could have exactly what you're describing, a new translation, you know, done to our specifications of the text that we prefer. But every time I push the argument as graciously and gently as I can with these folks, well, why not now? And okay, when? <laughs> I get a lot of confusing answers, mm. and the, the best I can come to is, you know, the value of this tradition is so high, and the things that people are doing to, you know, water down the truth of Scripture um, are so dangerous that we, we can't risk making a new translation. They also say that the scholars who produced the King James were so, you know, out of this world qualified, they were geniuses, that we could never, ever, you know, put together another group of such people to make a revision. They, they actually had an article about this mm. in their quarterly record, and I made a YouTube video about it because their own constituency is asking the same questions. They're saying, you know, if, if we're making new translations or revisions in other languages, which the Trinitarian Bible Society does, they're kind of a missionary organization, it's uh -huh. going back in the 19th, into the 19th century, um, then why can't we do it with English? And, you know, could we just replace the archaic words? And in my mind, I feel like I, I, then we get into whack-a-mole, where um, they'll say things that, I mean, I just find to be very weak, like we would, you know, we would destroy the concise beauty of the King James Version, you know, because mm -hmm. modern English can't express things with as much concision and brevity as, uh. as the King James translators did. And I say, you know, what you're praising there is a genuine value, and I want to maintain the aesthetic and literary quality of our Bible translations. That's one reason I chose the one that I did for my church. But we have to weigh these values. What about all of the obsolete lexemes, what I call dead words, you know, beeves, bold, B-O-L-L-E-D, and b-ray, B-E-W-R-A-Y. Uh, the King James Onlyists themselves, including the Trinitarian Bible Society, put out lists that go into the hundreds of these words. When, when is the tally of those words going to be sufficient that it's time for a revision? Um, and then I push this additional concept that we'll talk about more of false friends, words that we, words that we don't know we don't know. That mm -hmm. would be not obsolete lexemes, but obsolete senses of still current lexemes. And yeah. the focus of my work has been to push that, because it's one thing to tell people, go and don't be lazy, you know, make sure to use your dictionary when you study the Bible. You know, I'm the editor of Bible Study Magazine, I'm all about Bible study. But even yeah. that word study in the King James, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. In 1611, it did not mean hit the books, it meant be diligent. In yeah. the very passages that they'll sometimes use to, you know, insist that I'm wrong and I'm abetting, you know, Bible study laziness, they're actually widely misunderstanding the intent of the King James translators through no fault of their own, through no fault of the King James translators, but solely due to the inevitable process of language change. Now, you mentioned lists. These are lists like for people reading the KJV to learn new vocabulary or the old vocabulary? Yeah, like exactly. Pieces? Okay, like a little and, dictionary. And, uh, right, just a, a little word list with, you know, usually single word or a couple glosses, you know, next to them. It's not like they deny that there's a problem, right? You know, they're the ones putting out the list. They know that we don't use these words anymore. 
And uh, I'll say, well, aren't you just collecting a bunch of evidence to refute your own position? <laughs> and they just always come back to, well, we can't give in to the degradation of English. You know, English has dropped from its peak in the early 1600s. It's now largely deteriorated. And, you know, they don't teach English in schools these days. We got to uphold the standards. Don't dumb down the Bible. That's what I usually hear. The, the thing that I find most ironic and found most ironic at the Metropolitan Tabernacle was knowing Spurgeon's life and what he was accused of <laughs> as a pastor was that he dumbed down English so much to reach people and used language that was so contemporary for, you know, even the schoolboy to understand. And people were really mad about that. Very harsh criticism. So that's what I, I, I was looking at. And I couldn't believe, you know, how far it had come from his philosophy of ministry. That, that's what tradition does over time it gets encrusted. Yeah. And that's why we have the value of Semper Reformando. One of my best friends in this world of trying to graciously push back against the King James only movement for the sake of the plowboy, the very person that Spurgeon was so concerned to reach. Mm -hmm. um, his name is Elijah Hickson, and he works now for Dan Wallace at the Center for the Study of New Testament Manuscripts. He's also a massive lover of Charles Spurgeon, and he's come out with some great stuff even quite recently on the Evangelical Textual Criticism blog. You know, quotes cool. from Spurgeon that show that you're exactly right, Andrew. Uh, Spurgeon I, would be appalled. You know, I think he would recognize the conservative impulse, right? Like, there's yeah. something in there. We want to hold the Bible high. Yeah. You know, we, we, we don't want to dumb the Bible down. Yeah, I mean, like, I get that. But we have to, to weigh the genuine values of readability and accuracy. We, we have to do our careful work in corpus linguistics to discover, you know, are people really understanding this today? And what I really just cannot get an answer on from my King James Only brothers, people I love, some of whom have really become friends, and I am serious, it's kind of weird, but in our back and forth privately, I've really come to love some of these men. Hmm. Um, what I can't get from them is an answer to the question, okay, when? When are the number of archaisms going to be a sufficient problem to cause you to be ready for an update? And what I always hear is, well, you know, when English is a totally different language from what it was in 1611, when it's like Beowulf. And I say, but that's a process. That's a slow process. I mean, more than likely it is a slow process. We don't know the yeah. future. Sometimes languages can change quickly. Um, but given the size of English, given how many places it's spoken in, it's not going to happen quick. You know, at yeah. what point between now and Un totally unintelligible, are we going to recognize we've got to have an, at least a revision or update? Yeah. Now, specifically about the these and thous and the old verb conjugations that go with that, what would they say to just changing those, updating those? Same thing, it's you're losing the elegance of English? Yeah, especially with key common words like Seth, S-A-I-T-H, and spake, you know, thus spake he unto them. Right. There is... It gives a lilt, it gives a majesty and a grandeur to the King James that I don't care to deny. Now, mm -hmm. what I point out is it didn't have that grandeur, you know, originally. And if you think, what does originally mean? It doesn't necessarily mean 1611. They were revising the 1568 Bishop's Bible. Right. That was their stated task. So, you know, some of the King James, a great deal of it, in fact, I heard you mention this, um, goes back to William Tyndall, you know, 86% exactly. of the New Testament I've read. And, and I, at first I thought that was an urban legend. I went and found out, no, some folks really sat down and, and did the math. But then when it comes to the these and the thous and the yees and the yous, they insist and vociferously they insist that this is one of the marks of vast superiority of the King James over contemporary translations because contemporary mm. English, and I get to use my you know, academic terminology here because your audience can handle it, contemporary English does not mark second person pronouns for number right. in the same way that Elizabethan English did. Now, at that stage when the King James came out, thee and thou and ye and you were actually used to encode what's called the TV distinction. And you know this in Spanish, you know, tu and vu, yeah. um, or tu versus usted. Um, and in French, it's tu, vu, and I think that's where TV comes mm. from. It's, it's addressing uh, somebody informally, you know, an, an equal or inferior, like yeah. tu, uh, or, or somebody who is a superior, and that's where you use usted, or in this case, ye. It, you know, it's like speaking yeah. of them in the plural. So um, that is not how those words actually get used in Tyndall 
or in the King James. There's still some more work to be done on this. I would love for one of your listeners to either send me something that I've missed out there or do some more linguistic work, him or herself. But it seems to me, this is the case that I advanced and authorized, that what Tyndale did was he took the, this TV distinction and enlisted it to do something different in his New Testament translation hmm. so that he's not marking it for formality and informality. He's, he's using them to mark number. So okay. ye is plural, you is plural, and thee and thy and thine and thou, those are singular. And it is genuinely helpful in some cases, sure. you know, yeah. 15 or 20 or whatever, um, that it's a little harder to see in contemporary English, is Jesus speaking to a group or is he speaking to an individual? That's mm-hmm. definitely true. But I say footnotes can handle that pretty well fine. Sometimes modern translations will even say something like, you people. So um, uh-huh. Jesus said unto him, you people look for a sign, something like that. I think the New King James does that somewhere in John 4, 48 maybe. Yeah. Um, but the King James only uh, folks out there, they're, they're always telling me, this is utterly crucial. We, we have to know, you know, are, you know, are we talking about you plural or you singular? And when I argue back, as I did in a video that I just finished, that I'm just about to put up on my channel, well, how far does that go? Like how many, how many elements of grammatical information that actually can't really be brought across from Greek into contemporary English or Elizabethan English, how many of them should be marked? Like we don't mark relative pronouns for number, it's just who and whom, and that could be singular and that could be plural. But mm-hmm. Greek does, should we mark that? Right. Should we put little single underlines underneath who and double underlines underneath whom? And you know, what about grammatical gender? Sometimes that's important for right. you know, understanding the antecedent of a particular pronoun. Should we mark, you know, masculine words in blue and feminine words in pink and neuter ones in gray? Where does this stop? And often what I find in the King James only world, you know, of course it's unsophisticated. They they hardly ever know Hebrew and the great majority of them, as with the great majority of regular Christians in general, don't know Greek. So they don't know what they don't know. And it, yeah. It sounds appealing. Okay, I want to have every piece of information that God inspired. Again, that's good. I get that. I do too. Mm-hmm. But you have to reckon with the limitations that God himself has given us. This is what my new video is all about. He's the one who made it at Babel so that languages are somewhat incommensurate with each other. Mm-hmm. That, that in order to have a readable translation, you, you just can't get every little tiny piece of grammatical information across. There's going to have to be trade-offs and compromises and it's not like men are failing us to do this. It's, yeah. you know, God is the one who gave us this situation. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't think, uh, <laughs> I don't think anybody's going to be accepting y'all for a Bible translation anytime soon, but... Uh, <laughs> right. You got to talk about sociolinguistics too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they use that in the Bible project, uh, kind of jokingly half the time for, for communicating that. But this, this is really good. I, on your YouTube channel and in your book you talk about false friends at length. So you've, you've mentioned this, touched on this. Let's walk through some examples, if you could, and get as, as nerdy as you want to about these. That's, oh boy, you know, you don't know what you just invited me to do. Maybe you do, and you, <laughs> you still invited me to do it. I can nerd out for, you know, quite a long time. <laughs> Bring my, it on. My favorite, one, my favorite one to go to is 1 Kings 8.25, and I'm going to pull this up on my screen, actually. But uh, before we get to 1 Kings 8.25, I'll do, I'll, do, I'll do two to start with here. I want to okay. tell the story of the first one that really hit me, and that was in 1 Kings 18, where Elijah is on Mount Carmel, and he has this conflict with the priests of Baal, and he is, you know, mocking Baal, and I just think some wonderful classic passages and what Elijah says to the Israelites in this, you know, really dramatic scene, and I've been on Mount Carmel, he says, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. So I grew up in, you know, these King James only circles, uh, at least in high school. And before that, our churches weren't King James only, but they were using the King James. This is the early 80s. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I heard, you know, I don't know how many sermons I must have heard on this phrase because I memorized it. I'm sure it wasn't an Awana verse, but I memorized, how long halt ye between two opinions? 
you know, time passes. I moved on at age 18 to start reading contemporary versions, and I don't think I read the King James in, at any, you know, great length after that, um, really, to this day. I certainly use it all the time, but um, it's not been my daily reader ever since age 18. So I didn't have, a, you know, the opportunity to note until age 30 that the contemporary translations do something a little different with this passage. And I was writing a Bible textbook for eighth graders. I used to work at BJU Press. I loved that job. And we served people who used all kinds of different translations. So I just had to check them to make sure that something I wrote, you know, didn't fail to make sense, you mm. know, for a student who was using the NIV. So I was reading the ESV and it said, how long will you go limping? between two different opinions. If the Lord is God, follow him, but if Baal, then follow him. And I thought, limping? That's not right. Halt, <laughs> halting, halt is stop. Yeah. So that's what he was saying. Here's these two opinions, one on one side, one on the other. You're standing in between, you're just stopped. Mm -hmm. So I looked up the Hebrew, as I will do now, and it's posachim, and in halot, which I've got, here in Logos Bible Software, because I now work for that company and love the software. Oh, cool. The, the glosses they offer are be lame, limp, limp by, pass by, etc. I thought, mm -hmm. huh. So it says limp, so the ESV got it right, but I'm not accustomed to thinking of the King James translators as dummies. You know, I just can't imagine why they would have gotten it wrong. There's mm -hmm. got to be some other explanation. So I was kept thinking about it. I searched for the word halt in the King James, and I came to New Testament portions of the King James where the Gospels will say things like, um, it is better for thee to enter into life halt or maimed, or Jesus healed the halt and the blind, and it suddenly clicked with me. Duh! Yeah. Jesus is using the word the same way. The King James translators in 1611 used that word halt to mean limp. How long halt ye between two opinions means how long will you go limping between two opinions. But because yeah. we still have that word, and good old Ernst August Goethe with his relevance theory taught me that when we process language, we, we, we hit on the very first interpretation that makes the best sense, and we don't expend any more energy after that. Yeah. Why would we? If the stop meaning works, why would I even think to look this up? You know, my, my King James only brothers will always say to me, but don't be lazy, use the dictionary. And I'm saying, how would I have even known to look this up? If I hadn't noticed it in the ESV, I never would have looked it up. I would have died thinking this meant stop. Uh, and they <laughs> yeah. say, well, that's not a, not, not a big deal. You know, this doesn't, this doesn't uh, change the meaning of the passage. And I say, well, sure. It's not a doctrinal issue, you know, the limpers versus the stoppers. It's not two parties in Christianity. But if it's not such a big deal, then why are you insisting on retaining this? That is a false friend. I came to see dead words are words we know we don't know. But false friends are words we don't know we don't know. And that's, that's where I think the, the most, I don't know, rhetorical power lies in this argument because... I'm banking on common ground with my King James only brothers. They want to understand the Bible. I know they do. They taught me to read my Bible. They told me to read my Bible every day. Read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow, grow, grow. Mm -hmm. They want to understand. They will intuitively know as time passes, as I can get this little idea of false friends out to them, yeah, this is a problem. And right now, I'm kind of experiencing uh, mostly silence from the King James only world. Mm. Um, public silence, and privately I'm hearing from lots of individuals who are saying, yeah, I, ne I never realized this. I said I'd give two. I'll give another one really quick. Okay, here's 1 Kings 8, 25. Therefore now, Lord God of Israel, keep with thy servant David my father that thou promised him, saying, there shall not fail thee a man in my sight to sit on the throne of Israel, so that thy children take heed to their way, that they walk before me as thou hast walked before me. The question is, what does so that mean? And I'll read the key clause again. This is the promise of God to David, as relayed by Solomon at the temple dedication prayer. There shall not fail thee a man in my sight to sit on the throne of Israel, so that thy children take heed to their way, that they walk before me as thou hast walked before me. What does so that mean?
Well, relevance theory for me would make me just conclude that this is going to be the result. It's a yes. result clause. Yeah. The consequence. Mm-hmm. I'm going to make sure, God is saying to David, as relayed by Solomon, I'm going to make sure that a Davidic monarch is going to stay on the throne of Israel with the consequence and result that yeah. your children are going to take heed to their way. And I had this sent to me by a friend who went to a four-year King James-only Bible college and was a missionary on the field with the King James-only mission board, where if you weren't King James-only, you couldn't stay on their mission board. Right. That's a real reality out there. This is a conscience-binding issue for this group of Christians. Sure. And somehow he noted, that doesn't make good sense. There's right. not going to fail to be a Davidic monarch on the throne so that... The children of Israel obey? Well, that's mm-hmm. not what happened. <laughs> yeah. And he got poking around, and he noticed that the Hebrew was rock im, translated in all the modern translations, if only, or provided that. Uh-huh. It's also translated that way in the King James elsewhere. It is not, it does not mean a consequence or a result. It means a condition. You're going to have a man to sit on the throne of Israel as long as, provided that, if only, your children take heed to their way and walk before me as you have walked before me. Now, but there's a final step here to confirm this, and I didn't mention this with Halt, mm. but the Oxford English Dictionary, which is, you know, the exhaustive record of the yeah. history of the English language, doesn't just describe English as it exists today, although it does do that. It describes it going way back into its past. And if you look up Halt in the Oxford English Dictionary, and I've been using the OED now for years, like almost every day. I'm so grateful that my local library system has a subscription, otherwise it would be uh, 100 bucks awesome. a year. Yeah. <laughs> and I would have to pay because I absolutely need this tool. Halt, they'll show. There's a sense that means limping. And yeah. even with this little phrase, so that, they have faithfully recorded in the Oxford English Dictionary that it used to be able to, to mean provided that, if only. So wow. if I can see that there's like this contextual conflict, this doesn't quite make sense in the King James, mm-hmm. and I can go to the Hebrew and see, hmm, it doesn't mean what the King James means to me, but then I can go to the OED and see that there was a historical form of English, namely Elizabethan, in which it did mean the very thing the Hebrew means. It has to be. That's what the King James translators intended. I'm able to verify these false friends because I have multiple points, you know, like a triangle. I can look at contemporary English, I can look at the Hebrew or Greek, and I can look at historical English. And once I make that shape, it's solid. I know I have a false friend. Yeah. You know, and I'll, I'll just add this. I love Old English, so I prefer reading books from the 19th century. I love reading Jonathan Edwards. I read almost all of his works back in the day. And so I can speed read through 1700s, 1800s English, and that's not a problem for me. But even in spite of all of that exposure that I've had, I had no idea. There was no way I would have expected English to have changed the so that. Right. It's clause. random. It's it's really crazy. Yeah. And that's that's a very slippery one. Yeah. So I, I've often thought um, if there were some kind of pattern that I could teach people, you know, then maybe I could uh, see that the King James would have, you know, perfect continuing relevance for us today. And, and of course, I still use the King James every day. I use it in Bible study. I love the King James and I have, you know, tons of King James verses hidden in my heart. But when the distribution of obsolescence among lexemes, among, I never do know how to pronounce this word, syntagms, S-Y-N-T-A-G-M-S, mm-hmm. I've only read the word, never heard the word, uh, and punctuation, I mean, when it's spread just at, in, in utterly random places that you just can't teach people to expect, you, you really do need to become kind of an expert to even spot these things. And even so, you know, I count myself as among those few in the world who've really spent time on this and people send me examples that I didn't spot. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I just cannot put that burden on the plowboy. Why do we bother translating the Bible into a language that what the King James translators called the very vulgar, another false friend, a, a language they can't fully understand? So yeah. I've made this argument that First Corinthians 14 speaks to that that although Paul applies the principle to tongues, the principle of edification requiring intelligibility Mm. applies to other words that we utter in church and other words that Bible teachers, which is 
what Bible translators are in my mind. They're Bible teachers. Um, words that they use to edify the faithful need to be, as much as possible, intelligible. It's really great to listen to someone articulate things so clearly and also with such a genuine and sincere heart of compassion. I really appreciate that about Mark. I hope you did too. This is it for part one, and part two is going to be just as interesting and informative, so make sure to come back for that next week. Working for the Word is a podcast where we believe that the Bible is a unified, God-breathed, God-centered, hope-giving book, sweeter than honey and pointing to Jesus. This podcast exists to help us all treasure the Bible more, to go deeper into it, and become ultimately like the man of Psalm 1. Psalm 1.